But you have to not only know the combination, you have to know how they're distributed on the branches and you have to know their biophysical characteristics. When are they sensitive to the voltage and how fast do they open and how big do they open and so on. These can be described uh, by equations that were invented some time ago. In fact, Nobel Prize, two Nobel Prizes were awarded for this discovery. So it is possible to actually derive the combinations, get the distributions and find out the kinetics biologically through measurements. Now the next challenge that you have is that you need to know the relative concentrations. And this is a much more difficult data set to get. And what we discovered is that we can now collapse the fitting. We run a genetic algorithm that looks for the relative color co combinations. And when it finds the right combination of types of channels or colors, it actually matches some of these, be these behaviors. We can, recap we can capture all these different behaviors automatically. Before we started this project, it was literally a three-year project of a PhD to tweak these channels and to make the cell behave in that way. Today, we can push a button and we can generate as many of these cells as we want, millions or billions if necessary, with very um, high precision of uh, uh, biological processing. This is an example, we can just, the color code is voltage and when a cell is quiet, it's sitting at about minus 70 millivolts and it collects some, gets some inputs, it rises to about minus 40 millivolts and then it produces this spike of activity. So it's technically possible to create model neurons that are capturing and behaving almost the same as biological neurons. The next thing you have to do if you want to build a circuit is you need to know the recipe. How many of each type of cell do you need to put in each type of, in each layer? This is what we call a composition recipe and that comp comp composition recipe is then used in, an, in a, an application we call the distributor that runs through a series of steps in order to distribute each of these different types of neurons into a particular volume of the brain that we're trying to simulate and that allows us to to basically recreate and specify the composition and the location. But that's not going to work and it's not going to be enough if we want to get to a human brain. There's a hundred billion of these neurons. We haven't yet worked out all the different types, but once we understand the genetic types of neurons, we will still face a problem. How do we then position all these different neurons in the human brain? Now, there are new techniques today that are emerging. It's called ultramicroscopy that is allowing you, and this is in a mouse brain, that is allowing you to, within about a, an hour, to scan and map out the position of every single neuron in the brain. So a mouse brain has about 100 million neurons. You can take a, this microscope. If the cells are expressing a little fluorescent protein inside them, you can map out all the different positions of the cells. You can make these cells express this fluorescent protein for, for different kinds of genes. And then you can get as many maps as you want that tells you about the distributions of different types of, of cells. Now the secret in the end to be able to position them is to, is to exactly take into account all the multi-omic levels, all the levels of organization. These are brain maps of ge different genes that are expressed in the brain. And what we can do is, is we can use one map. When we want to build a particular model with all the distributions, we say it, when we built it, it must account for this map and this map and this map and another 100, 200, 300 maps. When you start adding maps, it collapses very quickly. There's not many options how you can position these neurons. And that's the, again, the principle that from the macroscopic constraints, you can actually specify microscopic detail. And this is going to make it faster and easier for us to specify the specific detail in the cell. Let's go back. We don't have, we're not there yet. This is what we are. We have the actual neurons already in 3D, not synthesized and we can start building a microcircuit. So here we have 
we're calling up the neurons from the database. We've cloned as many of them as we need of each of the types and we can load them within it. And you get this reconstruction in the same volume as accurately as you can for spatial distributions, a piece of the, the neocortex of the rodent. Now you face the next challenge. You have to start connecting them. Now your brain has about a, a thousand trillion synapses. In this part, you have about 10 million or so synapses and you have to find out where they are. So what we, ha what we can do is look and see where these cells touch. But before that, we go back to the data. And if you go to the data, what you dis what, and this was a huge number of experiments, you discover that you can s find out where these cells all touch each other and they form what are called synapses. Now it looks like a mess. And the first time you look at it, you think, okay, that's it, let's all go home. There's no way you'll ever understand this. But if you keep doing many of these recordings, you discover there are patterns. There are statistical patterns of where these synapses are going to be located. The question was, how are we going to capture that in a model? And what we found in another set of experiments is that actually when neurons are connected and are talking to each other, the fiber that's crossing, that is providing that synapse, there's very little difference from a fiber that is not providing the synapse. So that led us to conclude that what we should try first is just look for where these fibers are touching. So we did that and we built an algorithm together in our collaboration with IBM that searched, it's called the collision detector, that searches and it runs on a blue gene, it searches for the appositions, how close these branches get. The first time we built, it, ran the algorithm, took a couple of days. Today it takes seconds because of optimization and improvement. It finds about a hundred million of these locations of where they touch. But then we don't know if they're correct. So we analyze the positions, the statistical positions, where all these different types of synapses are and we discovered that they, we didn't have to do anything. We thought we were going to have to spin and rotate and juggle and fit these neurons together and we didn't have to do anything. They all exactly, well not exactly, they about 98% fitted the experimental data. So biology had solved the magical solution for creating massive connectivity by just randomly throwing these branches together. You just throw them in a bucket, you look at where they touch and that is what biology is actually doing anyway. So what you have to do is take from all these possible touches and downsample so that you can find only those where they are going to form a synapse and talk to each other. And this is a rule of synaptic selection or synaptic formation and once they form these connections then they become, there becomes a live contact. So it's like you've got this massive connectivity in the brain and there's a downsampling where you get the specific functional connectivity that allows the neurons to all start talking to each other and that accounts for these thousand trillion synapses. We haven't run this algorithm yet but we now uh, we apply in the meantime a connection probability between these uh, cells and what that gives you is basically all the synapses that are connecting these neurons. This is about 10 million synapses. The red ones are excitatory synapses. They excite the brain. The, the blue ones are the inhibitory ones and they control the excitation. They carve the excitation. And so for the first time we could actually computationally derive the positions of synapses in the brain and solve in some part the, what we call the connectome problem. And in this case, this is what I mean by predictive reverse engineering where we apply these rules that we've learned in biology to actually computationally map out and find out where all the synapses are in the brain. You can accelerate this process computationally and by building the model. Now we discovered another amazing thing which is very relevant to technology is that you can actually take these neurons and spin them and rotate them and put them in almost any position. The map of where the synapses are doesn't change. It actually stays invariant and it's the secret to why the map of synapses in our brain actually can be the same even though the branches are different and the neurons individually are different. More importantly, if you delete neurons, you wipe out neurons, wipe out half the neurons, this map of where the synapses are doesn't change. 
So in fact, in biology, it's discovered an incredible secret. The way that it gets to an invariant, totally, highly robust connectivity is by making sure that every single neuron is slightly different. In technology, you spend billions to make sure that every transistor is exactly the same. In the brain, it does exactly the opposite in order to make sure that it's a highly robust system. Now, because it's so robust, this, we can now take the circuits that we build get the very detailed map and collapse it into a simple connectivity map. And once we have that simple connectivity map, we can export it to an application, an artificial neural network. So you know DARPA and many others are hunting to, to build neuromorphic processes and clever uh, mach uh, machines, and they're imagining this circuit. Well, in this strategy, you just push a button and export the circuit and you can implement it onto a neuromorphic chip or into artificial neural networks and we're currently uh, exploring this option together with our colleagues in Heidelberg that have already developed a lot of this technology to implement and integrate these, these uh, circuit designs. In fact, that's the one key thing missing in neuromorphic engineering is the circuit designs. Let's continue. Next step, once you've got your neurons, you've got your connections, you have to actually capture in a mathematical model, the communication between these neurons. Now, this, a, a synapse is probably the most uh, complex submicron device, I dare say, in the universe. It is a, a very complicated little machine, but it's, it's, it's especially interesting because when one neuron talks to one neuron, it will behave in a particular way, and if it talks to another neuron, it behaves in a different way. You can think of synapse as a bit like as, a, as filters. You have low pass filters and band pass filters and high pass filters and you actually need to know all the different filters that are used between the different cells so that you can capture the communication between the cells. So in summary we can we got a basic blueprint of the circuitry we know what the equations are, we have the equations, there's no, no new mathematics here that has to be invented the equations for the, to simulate the, the flow of ions within cables, the way these ion, these ion channels open and close. We have the equations that describe this dynamic synaptic transmission. So we have to go to the next step and prepare for blue gene simulations. And in fact, I went to IBM when I was in about 2000, I think it was, when they were just starting before it was sold, the Blue Gene series, already then, because it collected all this data, and I said, okay, I mean, where is the machine? And it looked like that was going to be the solution, and we went there and discussed. And in fact, this is, this, they, IBM doesn't know it, they think they built it for something else, but actually it was designed for building, uh, running simulations on uh, brain simulations. So, we, uh, as you can imagine, what we do, we throw the neurons onto different processes. The, when the cell spikes, it's a very simple communication. Just spike times are communicated between cores today. But before we can do anything with that, we need to build now a new visualization. We have to visualize this. So we had to build a mesh generator that will take this biological structures and turn them into mesh models and we had to also build a dedicated real-time rendering machine um, and we had to integrate that into a uh, in silico or virtual environment so that I as a biologist can sit there and play with it as a biologist experiment with it and so we built this what we call blue hub which is an environment where we can actually design an in silico or virtualized experiment and that's what you get first reconstruction and simulation of a neocortical column which is the heart of the mammalian brain it's the heart of our intelligence this is the eye of the brain this is the, you may think that your eye is the eye and it's not the eye just collects some fragments of information about the world sends it in and this is the machine that generates perceptions so now we have a way to systematically start decomposing how this machine is working and what are the uh, principal mechanisms behind the molecules, the synapses, um, 
the communication and the computational strategies that it's using.